Hey guys, if you're watching this in the spring of 2020, we are under social distancing regulations by the CDC for the coronavirus. So I'm doing a little bit from home. And since I'm at home, I like to work outside if I can. So here we have my lovely patio area where I'll be talking to you today about the steps of doing a correlation analysis. So I'm gonna put myself down here in the corner, um, real small, just so you can still see me if you need. While we take a look at how you would walk through from start to finish on a correlation analysis. Um, we have this handout, M4.1, Steps for Doing a Correlation Analysis, that walks you through all the different pieces you need to do. And what I'm gonna do is show you this piece by piece and what it would look like with a specific example. Usually we would do this in class, but if you couldn't be in class, or um, if you're looking at this in a future semester, here's what you missed. So first off, if we were setting up a correlational analysis, we would need to be using ordinal interval or ratio data. We cannot do a regular correlation um, with nominal data. We'd need a specialty correlation that we're not learning in this class. So we would first wanna make sure that we are looking for a relationship between the variables and to say what our hypothesis is. In this particular case, we're looking at whether there might be a correlation between how strongly one's friends see them as a sports fan Sorry, there's a truck going by, and the amount of sporting apparel that they own. So we're gonna set that up saying, I expect there will be a correlation. We don't really do research looking for nothing. So our research hypothesis is always going to either for us be showing that we expect a relationship to happen between those two things, or if we were doing a Z-test or T-test that we expect a difference between this group and that group um, for the, the variable of interest. So step one, I expect there'll be a correlation. Step two, we have to determine the level of scaling that we have for each variable. Sports fan three, which is how strongly one's friends see them as a sports fan is ordinal. If we look at the opening survey, this was scored from a score of one very much to eight, not at all. So let's keep in mind, a higher score here means I am not much of a sports fan. Second, um, sports fan nine, how many pieces of sporting apparel do you own is ratio. If we look at that variable, it said, how many do you own? Here, a zero is meaningful. If you got no sporting, sporting apparel, you don't have any jerseys, you don't have any hats, etc. cetera. Um, so that zero is a meaningful absolute zero. So we've got a ratio variable there. So sports fan three is ordinal, sports fan nine is ratio. This is one of the two pieces we need to decide whether we're doing Spearman or Pearson. The other thing is the shape of the variables. So next we'd need to go to SPSS and make a histogram for each of these. Now you can do this with graphs by using legacy dialogues and making a histogram. I like to do it with analyze and descriptive stats and explore because I can ask it to give me the descriptives I can ask it to make me a histogram. Um, I could also do a normality test to see with a Kamalgaroff Smirnoff test whether it is um, skewed or has a lot of kurtosis or not. So I'm gonna do it here in Explore because I get more bang for my buck. And when I click OK, we would figure out that we got 159 people who answer those questions. Here's my descriptives if I wanted to look at those. I can figure out with a normality test that both of these are not approximately normal. Now I have a helicopter going over. All right, so give me a second to get rid of the helicopter noise. And if we look at sports fan, we see that it is um, skewed here negatively because we have a lot of people who aren't seeing themselves as much of a sports fan. And then if we look at how much sporting apparel, it's skewed right or positive because most people only have a few pieces of sporting apparel and only one person has a whole lot of stuff. So if we go back to our sheet, we have figured when we run the histograms that one is negatively skewed, the other is positively skewed. Now we have what we need for step four about which correlation to use. Remember we can only do a Pearson correlation which is prickly, particular, precise, kind of like the uptight correlation of the group if we have interval and ratio data and, all right, um, both are approximately normal. In this case, if we look at it here, 
right? We can't use Pearson because one of our variables is ordinal and both of them are skews. So we have to pick the Spearman correlation, which is the more fluid or flexible one, right? Like a snake, like the hippie of the group that says, hey man, you're not perfect, we'll do a correlation anyway. Come on in, right? So our Spearman correlation um, is what we're gonna need. Now we're actually ready to run the correlation. So on a test question, if it says run a correlation, all this stuff you've gotta do first. Right? Then we can put it into our hypothesis test stuff. Let me get my cursor here. All right. Please note that this data set changes every semester. So I recorded this video in the spring of 2020. It'll match it if you try to run it and you'll get what I get. If you do this in a future semester, yours may look a little different depending on how the last batch of people answered the questions. Okay. All right. Step one, state our hypotheses in both math, which means scientific notation, and in English in a sentence. So I've got my null, nothing going on, nothing to see here. These aren't the droids you're looking for, hypothesis. And I've got my alternate hypothesis, that something is going on. In this case, we're looking for a relationship or correlation. So our null hypothesis, rho equals zero, because I'm doing a two-tailed test in this case, looking for a positive or a negative relationship, says um, there's not going to be anything happening. There will not be a correlation between those two variables. The thing that I'm expecting or looking for from my research hypothesis is that there is a correlation, that there will be a relationship, that these two things will go together, either as one goes up, the other goes down, or vice versa, or that they're moving in the same direction, right? So here, our alternate hypothesis says this actually should there will be a correlation between friends seeing you as a sports fan and how much sporting apparel one owns. We then have to set our boundaries. We have to set our predetermined limits for what we're going to accept as interesting, meaningful, stands out, doesn't typically happen. So we set our alpha level at 0.05. If you remember from z tests, we're kind of looking at a normally shaped distribution, and we're looking for those scores or correlations that would happen at either end if it's two-tailed, or we could lump this all onto one side if we're doing a one-tailed, to figure out what are the unlikely scores. We will set our alpha level at 0.05 um, as a way to kind of balance between possibility for type one and type two errors. And then we've got to go to the table in the back of our book. Uh, I got to get to the Spearman table to show you all. All right, uh, let's see, how close can you get it? Here's the book. You're not gonna be able to see it too well because it's kind of up in the video, but I'm gonna try to move it over here and show you where I'm looking. If I am doing a two-tailed test with how many people? I've got about 159 right now, so I'm going all the way down here past 100. That's as high as I'm going in this particular table. My number's bigger than that, so I'll use the last one here. If I'm doing a two-tailed test in my Spearman correlation, there's a different table for Pearson, two-tailed, over 100 people, my magic value is, wow, let's find it. 0.197. 0.197's our magic value. All right, this might change if you've got a really small sample set. So you're gonna have to check that critical value in the back of your book because it won't be exactly the same for every data set. So if you look here, when we use that alpha level of 0.05, and in this case, we we're just looking for a relationship, positive or negative, we picked a two-tailed test, and we looked that up in the Spearman table to get that 0.197, all right? SPSS uses this value, but it won't show it to you. The only way to get the critical value is to go to your book or another stats table if you don't have a book, you know, for a correlation probability table. All right, step three, run your analysis by hand or SPSS. I make you guys do SPSS. You can thank me because other stats professors like to have them do it by hand. That takes a whole nother bit of time we don't have this semester. So we're going to go to SPSS and run our correlation. We go to analyze. Correlate, bivariate, that means two variables. And I've already popped in variable um, sports fan three and nine. I know I'm looking for a Spearman correlation, but I've left Pearson on two because it gives me the means and standard deviations. If I only put on Spearman, it won't want to give me those means and standard deviations because it knows that's a non-parametric test. Um, technically, for Spearman, you should report the median and interquartile range. If someone was being really super picky with you, for stats, I am okay with you guys knowing to report a mean and standard deviation here. 
um, because you're beginning. So I leave on Pearson and Spearman so I can get those descriptive stats under options. I'm sticking with a two-tailed test. I'm okay if that correlation is positive or negative. Um, and then it'll flag the significant correlations for me. It'll put a little asterisk um, if we get anything that is past that critical value and out in the tails, okay? When I click OK, it runs the correlation for me, all right? Here we get our descriptive statistics. So I've put those in the handout. And then I write it out because when you write a paper, you can't just copy and paste your SPSS junk in there. You've got to report it in the way that we need for a manuscript. So I'm showing you here, this is what SPSS gave me. And then here's how I would write it. Remember that you're going to italicize all stat letters that you use. This is true for any stats test that you're running. Italicize those little letters that you put to show what the values are. Okay. Then I'm not going to look at the Pearson correlation. I'm going to look at the Spearman one because I said Spearman was most appropriate. And the Spearman correlation shows me a value here. Correlation coefficient. This is also the degree of covariance between those two things. Negative 6.2 point, excuse me, negative 0.627. So um, I'll come back and show you how to make the scatter plot, but I've put those results here as well. So we can see this is what SPSS gave us. This is what we would write in a manuscript or a homework answer that we would show that our Spearman value, R sub S, with 157 degrees of freedom, that's the number of scores that can vary, which for correlation is equal to the sample size for however many people answered both of those questions, minus two. So if this is 159 minus two, I'm gonna have a degrees of freedom of 157. And I made that correlation value equal to negative 0.63. I brought it up to two decimals and showed that my probability or my likelihood of finding that um, score was less than 0.05. So again, we're finding a correlation that doesn't happen too often. This is something that we would be interested in and go, Yep, that looks interesting. That looks meaningful. All right, I've got three minutes left. How to make a correlation. Go to graphs, legacy dialogues, scatter plot. Just do a simple one, nothing fancy, and put in your two variables. Doesn't matter which one you put first. Um, you could put in a title, but APA likes those title labels off to the side, so we don't have to do that. And we don't need anything under options. We just need to go ahead and make a graph. Once we get that scatter plot, it's good to get rid of the grid lines. APA doesn't like the grid lines. So I double clicked it. I went to options and I'm gonna hide those. So we have less junk and just the actual data points. So here's my scatter plot, which we can see that kind of, if we eyeballed that line of best fit across here, in fact, let's put it in. We can have it under options um, do a fit line. I think the easiest way to show you guys this is this little button right here, add a fit line. All right, and that shows us our correlation value, our regression line, our line of best fit. All right, so now I've got that fit line to see that it is a negative correlation between those two things. I will have to update my graph in a minute on the key, you know, to show that fit line here, All right? And if I were writing this up for a manuscript, I might want to change these labels to be, have capital letters and be a little shorter. But now we've got everything we need. We decided that this finding is significant because our correlation value, negative 0.63, was past the boundary that we set of 1.197. Right? It was out in the weeds. It was further out. So we've got a significant value. We reject the null. And then this is how it would look if we wrote it all up. All right? We would need to make sure to tell them, was your hypothesis supported? I did that with two words right at the beginning, as hypothesized. Then I tell my readers, was it significant? In our case, yes. What is its size? This should be large because Cohen says anything above 0.5 or below negative 0.5 is large, and it's a negative relationship. So look how much I'm packing into this first sentence. As hypothesized, there was a significant large negative relationship between friends seeing someone as a sports fan and the amount of sporting apparel owned. 
So we're gonna reject the null and support the hypothesis. The very last thing to do is make sure you explain this to your non-math friend who doesn't